November 26, 1942. U.S. troops are engaged in fierce urban combat. Surrounded and outnumbered, they retreat into a building. They fire their shotguns, and several foes fall down dead or wounded. This is their first clash with a powerful new enemy, the Australians. Wait, wait, what? What? I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a World War II special episode on tensions between American soldiers and their host nations. Okay, that introduction was a bit of an exaggeration. The US and Australia remain firm allies, but on the nights of November 26 and 27, the city of Brisbane, Queensland descends into violence. Americans fight Australians. Americans fight other Americans, and by the end of it all, one Australian will be shot dead. Across the globe, in Liverpool, England, a fight breaks out between West Indian soldiers and white Americans. A West Indian is injured, and a white Briton is slashed with a razor. What is going on? Why are these supposed allies brawling in the streets? Well, things don't start off that way, of course. Initially, relations are quite rosy. In December 1941, Australian Prime Minister John Curtin requests that American forces come to Australia because he believes Britain is unable to guarantee Australia's security against Japanese invasion. After a diplomatic row with Churchill, who feels slighted at the suggestion, the first contingent of 8,600 Americans arrive on December 22nd in Brisbane. The newcomers have all been given a short pamphlet entitled Instructions for American Servicemen in Australia, which tells them that the Aussies are a people who like Americans and whom you will like. They're a pioneer people, they believe in personal freedom, they love sports, and they're out to lick the axis all the way. And everyone is on their best behavior. With their neat uniforms and, and crisp manners, the Americans live up to their Hollywood reputation. U.S. troops soon arrive in the U.K. as well. The first 4,000 disembark on January 26, 1942 in Belfast. They are there to deter any lingering threat of a German invasion of Ireland, free up British troops for service in the Middle East, and complete their own training in what is technically a war zone. Sentiments in the U.K. are as positive as those in Australia, with a Sunday Times correspondent reporting, One was impressed by the easy courtesy and quick intelligence of the men. The visit quickly dispelled any idea of loose discipline among American troops. So far, so good. But once the novelty wears off, problems arise. A major point of conflict is a huge disparity in pay. American soldiers are some of the best paid in the world. An unmarried private with less than three years service can expect to receive $60 per month. This is a base pay of 50 with a 20% bonus for overseas service. This far outstrips the Australian private who earns the equivalent of about $42. The British private does even worse. He takes in just one third of his American colleague's income, about $21. By February 1942, only a month after the first Americans arrived, complaints are so numerous that the issue is debated in Parliament. The MP, Captain Cunningham Reed, tells the House that the low pay means the British private often finds himself in a humiliating position when he meets soldiers from other countries. This is undoubtedly true. A soldier writing home in the summer of 1942 recounts an evening of American mockery at the pub over his low pay. When we came outside after the place had closed, there was an army lorry waiting for the Yanks. We stood there and watched them pile in. The one who had been doing all the shouting put his hand in his pocket, and as the lorry pulled away, threw about a bob's worth of coppers at us and shouted above the other's laughter, get yourself a cup of tea each, you poor little bastards. If I could have laid my hands on him, I, like many more, would have busted his pan. I think they stink. However, the very thing that puts off Australian and British soldiers has the opposite effect on local women. The fatter American wallets mean they can more easily afford to take their British and Australian girlfriends to dances or to the cinema. They also have access to luxuries like alcohol, tobacco, ice cream, chocolate, nylon stockings, all of which are either rationed or in short supply, but which can be bought from their post exchange, the PX, post exchange shops on the base. And it's not just their money and their presence. British and Australian soldiers are limited 
to both working and socializing in their battered service uniforms, but Americans can don a set of dress uniforms designed to make them look good. Maureen Meadows, a young woman from Brisbane, sums up the view of tens of thousands of women across Britain and Australia. We liked everything about the Yanks, in fact, and we just couldn't help staring at them the way we did at first. From the tops of their personable caps to the toes of their shining shoes, they were the neatest and most glamorous soldiers we had ever laid eyes on. This just adds to festering resentment. In letters home, British soldiers complained bitterly of the Americans outspending them and of stealing their women. One young man writes miserably that the Americans are too well paid and flash their cash around. What chance has a poor Tommy with a couple of bob jingling in his pocket? Contrasting attitudes to race relations also play a part in disagreements. Segregation is maintained on American bases. But outside them, in British towns and villages, it's the British who set the rules. And in Britain, there is no state-sanctioned discrimination. Now, this does not mean it's a land of racial harmony, and there is an informal color bar in operation which restricts access to employment, housing, and services for, uh, for black people, Indians, Chinese. But 10,000 West Indians serve in just the RAF alone, and black Britons are enlisted and conscripted into the army, the navy, home guard, the ATS, where they work side by side with white Britons. And both black Britons and black Americans use the same pubs, the same dance halls, and the same shops as the white ones. Yeah, and this soon causes tension. British society is shocked by the way the US Army treats its black soldiers. A teenager in Liverpool recalls walking along the outer wire of an American camp after running an errand for, for the white American soldiers. Shouting spread to every corner behind the fence, and as the words became clearer, I realized that they were yelling abuse at the lone soldier walking along on our side of the wire. He was, of course, a black man. I was about 14 at the time, and I could not understand why the sight of a black man walking along the road could arouse so much hatred and abuse. It's not just black Americans who face abuse. As early as June 1942, the British Colonial Office records complaints about the treatment of West Indian soldiers by white Americans. West Indians in Liverpool are prevented from entering service hostels and are beaten up for dancing or dining with white women or drinking in the wrong pubs. These West Indian soldiers are British subjects and white Britons often take their side when physical violence occurs. That razor slashing incident I mentioned occurred after an incident in Liverpool's Grafton Ballroom where white Americans square up against West Indians and white Britons. The fight itself is hushed up by the censors, but it is just one of many incidents that occur. And it's the white Americans who largely win in the end, as many businesses bow to pressure and start enforcing segregation. In Australia, things are a bit different, but the race issue still contributes to tension. Australians aren't so much concerned about the racial discrimination. I mean, this is a country that pursues a white Australia policy restricting immigration of non-Europeans. However, they are appalled at the violence employed by American military police in dealing with black soldiers. See, Australian military and civil police generally try to operate with delicacy. When reports begin emerging as early as March 1942 that African Americans are being shot by white MPs for minor infractions, and when this use of excessive violence extends to white Australian servicemen, well, that is bound to poison relations. By the autumn of 1942, the tensions over pay, over women, and over the military police begin to reach a boiling point down under. In just one week of October, there is a knife fight between an American servicemen and three Australians, leaving one Australian dead. Another Australian is shot by an American military policeman, and an American soldier stabs a young Australian woman and three other US soldiers. These incidents, well, they're hushed up by wartime censorship, but the stories spread anyhow, and they're often exaggerated. An incident on November 12th, in which an American corporal shoots and kills an American and an Australian on a train in Inkerman, a town north of Brisbane, morphs into an outlandish affair with entire trainloads of GIs and Aussies exchanging gunfire. All this mistrust comes to a head 
and two nights of rioting starting November 26. Once again, it is thanks to heavy-handed military policing and alcohol. At around 7 p.m., a group of Australian soldiers witnesses a confrontation between a drunken American private, James Stein, and an American military policeman, Anthony O'Sullivan. The Australians already detest the American MPs, and when Stein is arrested for being too slow to produce his leave pass, the Australian soldiers protest. The MP raises his baton as if to strike the Australians, and they rush him. In minutes, the whole street dives in. More MPs arrive to support their colleague, and Australian soldiers and civilians assist their countrymen. The MPs retreat to the safety of their PX. An angry crowd of Australians rapidly gathers outside, as many as 2,000 strong. Bottles, rocks, and other objects are hurled at the building. In response, the Americans arm themselves with shotguns. The crowd, the crowd is enraged and attempts to relieve one of the MPs, Private Norbert Grant, of his weapon. This does not go at all well. Australian Edward Webster struggles with Norbert. Norbert pulls the trigger. Webster takes a shotgun blast to the chest. He falls down dead. Two more shots are fired, and five more Australian servicemen and a civilian are injured by Grant's shotgun. Grant is badly beaten and retreats into the PX. Wild rumors spread across the city of Americans wielding Tommy guns, of Australians stealing rifles from armories and bodies piled outside the PX. Fired by vengeance, the next evening, the 27th, gangs of Australians attack any Americans they can get hold of. GIs and Australians brawl in the streets outside Douglas MacArthur's headquarters. An Australian woman, Margaret Scott, is out walking with her American husband on Edward Street in the center of town when they are attacked. I got knocked over twice and hit in the stomach and back and jaw. I couldn't see John except for about 10 soldiers punching him. I can't explain the terror of all these hundreds yelling, kill him, kick him, kick his brains out. In a civilized world and country, you cannot imagine anything like this. Have you ever seen a mob go mad? A heavy military and civilian police presence keeps disturbances to a minimum the next evening, and the incident is suppressed by the authorities for fear of disturbing the wartime alliance. Just four Australians and no Americans are punished. Norbert Grant, the MP who fired his shotgun, he gets off scot-free. But as the US Army grows ever bigger and ever more troops are deployed overseas, incidents like the Battle of Brisbane will keep on happening. In fact, 1943, looking into the future, will bring some equally dramatic and deadly events as simmering tensions come to a head in Lancashire. If the Allies can't even be trusted to live side by side, will they really be able to fight shoulder to shoulder? I suppose only time will tell. To find out more about how the U.S. Army prepared itself for war, you can click right here to watch our special on the conscripts and conscientious objectors of World War II. And to get more content like this and like that, and all the great stuff we have planned for 1943, please join the Time Goes to Army at timegoes.tv or patreon.com, or even raise your pledge, because every single dollar does allow us to make more and more and more and more stuff. See you next time. Mm -hmm.